Emily, what's on your radar? Well, populists on the left and right find common ground on many issues, economic and cultural. Abortion is not one of them, but opponents of the powerful political and media establishment should care about elite distortion of this important debate. There's a serious discussion on the right about the legal and practical wisdom of Texas's new abortion law. Every honest person left and right can at least agree it is a dramatic piece of legislation with high stakes consequences. Now, depending on your perspective, that's either tragic or wonderful. Now, why to the right should it be wonderful? I am not here to debate the wisdom of the bill, which may indeed be replicated soon by other states, but outside, let's say, Fox News, there's almost no representation of the anti-abortion perspective in major media. That means this entire conversation is completely distorted. A 2020 survey found that eight in 10 journalists who said they leaned towards one party or ideology, which was 78% of them, identified as liberal or Democrats. The same survey found, found that sampled journalists were, quote, far to the left of the average Twitter user and even to the left of prominent liberal politicians like former President Barack Obama. The vast majority of Democrats, of course, support abortion rights, as Gallup has found in recent years. Now, even all the way back in 1990, David Shaw of the LA Times noted, quote, most major newspapers support abortion rights on their editorial pages, and two major media studies have shown that 80 to 90 percent of U.S. journalists personally favor abortion rights. We know from the bulk of legacy media coverage that journalists are liberal on abortion. Some on the left actually dispute this arguing that media's insistence on including both sides of the debate and coverage gives abortion opponents undue moral equivalence. Now, the public is not broadly pro-life. The right should understand that. According to Gallup, only 32% of Americans support overturning Roe. A full 58% oppose it. That said, according to Gallup, Americans who believe abortion should be legal in all circumstances are easily outnumbered by those who believe it should be legal only under certain circumstances. Actually, as of 2021, the percentage of Americans who identify as pro-choice and pro-life differs by only two points, 49 to 47% respectively. That includes 40 percent of women. So why is this important? Because as with many issues, it means our national debate pits the liberal perspective against a straw man, rendering the whole, the whole discussion completely unproductive. Chris Cuomo demonstrated this really well recently. Now, it almost feels kind of unfair to pick on Cuomo at this point, given how he's like so thoroughly beclowned himself, but he's employed as a quote anchor at one of the country's largest news networks, which oversees one of the most visited websites in the world. As people digested the news out of Texas, Cuomo tweeted a quote from Professor Carlos Chapman that asked whether opponents of abortion would back starting child support, citizenship, and life insurance for unborn babies, applying they would not because they are hypocrites. Cuomo purports to follow this issue closely, as is his job. He once claimed the pro-life movement was more about, quote, faith and feelings than facts, which would be fine if he didn't claim to be neutral. Nevertheless, if he actually understood the pro-life position, he would know that Chapman's attempted counterpoint is not a dunk at all. It's something most pro-life people would get behind. That's exactly why childcare proposals like Senator Mitt Romney's start during pregnancy. If you don't talk about these issues with the 47% of the country that considers itself pro-life, you end up operating off a stereotype that caricatures the pro-life movement as just feeling-based fundamentalist rubes who haven't fully thought through their position. That's how the debate is then represented by the political establishment. Pro-life activists are as skeptical of the Republican elite as progressives are of the DNC. As I said on this show after the Texas law was signed, I bet it made a whole lot of people at the RNC very, very nervous. Now, college graduates and people whose households earn over $100,000 a year are much, much more likely to identify as pro-choice than people with some or no college education in lower household income brackets. Those old white Republican men Democrats like to imagine as villains from The Handmaid's Tale, a whole lot of them would be pretty unhappy if Roe were overturned because they're much more concerned about the politics than the policy. Why do you think Republicans in Congress rarely prioritize actual pro-life causes when they're in control? Now, my political philosophy is basically that big business and big government are inherently corrupt and power hungry and need reasonable checks. I'm a cultural conservative Christian. I used to be much more libertarian on abortion, especially until about 12 weeks. Even so, I'm, oppo I'm so opposed to government controlling women's bodies that I believe prostitution should be, should be legal. But as I learned more about abortion, my perspective changed. I think life begins at conception and the Fifth Amendment then legally and morally protects that life. You do not have to agree with me at all. I know most of you watching 
abortion? Probably don't. But the bad faith partisan caricature of abortion opponents as fundamentalist idiots and cynical sexists is not broadly true and is therefore not helpful. People are not uniformly pro-life because they're religious zealots eager to control women's bodies. It's often pro-abortion men who coerce women into aborting their babies against their will who try to control the female body. One of them is CNN's chief legal analyst. But the political establishment and the media do not accurately represent this debate, which splits the country almost perfectly in half. People are pro-life because they believe the baby is alive and should not be killed. That is the proper starting point for the pro-life side of this debate. As conversation over new state laws and legal challenges to Roe heats up in the coming months, we'd all do well to recognize that. Ryan, I want to start with you because I think there's something important here when we're talking about the Texas law in particular, and then when we start to talk more and more this fall about Roe and the potential for Roe being outright overturned by the Supreme Court. I think this debate would be a lot more useful if the left sort of accurately recognized and represented that for pro-life people it's a matter of life and death, and thus this sort of emergency uh, framing of the issue makes a whole lot more sense. So like when you look at what the Texas abortion law does, again, you can say if this is if this is a position that literally believes babies are being killed every single day, that legislation makes a whole lot more sense. But there's really nobody in major media making that argument. So it's just like we're all talking about the handmaid's tale. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think you're right that there is a dearth of uh, those types of voices in the, in the mainstream media. And I, and I think people would benefit from hearing them so they can combat them uh, more more effectively. Uh, exactly. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm with that. Um, doesn't doesn't mean you have to agree with it. Doesn't mean you're you're there. But sure, I would I would be interested to hear from, you know, somebody in Texas who thinks that this is this bounty hunter thing is a good idea mm -hmm. and like why they think it's it's a good idea. Uh, I, there's no there's remotely uh, no argument that's going to be anywhere near persuasive to me, <laughs> but I, I still want to so. see I still want to <laughs> see the argument. I still want to like get get my head around you know where 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 this where this is coming from because I do have my own ideas of where it's coming from. And Kim, this actually kind of reminds me of the vaccine conversation because there are so few people that are genu genuinely sort of vaccine hesitant in the major media, and a lot of this I think does have to do with education and income levels and the way sorting affects us and affects media bias. But there there are so few people in the media that actually like truly understand why people are hesitant to take the vaccine, which is you know like 30 percent of the country right now, and it, there's no representation representation of them in major media, and worse, there's just no representation or understanding of that perspective because they don't really engage with or want to engage fairly with people who are in that position. So the messaging has been a complete disaster. Do you see any parallels here? Oh, absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, you, you bring up a really great point, which is that, and which is really largely missing from this debate and something that I even myself, as somebody who's very staunch, I'm very opposite of you. I'm very staunchly pro-choice. I believe that that is a choice between a doctor and a woman all the way up until the very end. Um, but because of a variety of reasons that we're not going to get into today. But <laughs> uh, nonetheless, you know, the, the, there are a lot of Democrats who are pro-life. And they are not represented at all in the in the discussion. They're not asked any questions. Uh, they're just kind of shoved aside like they don't exist. And you're right that people paint this discussion as you no, know, it's just a bunch of right wing Christian loons. Uh, and and you know all the Democrat, all the left is pro choice, and all the right is is pro life. And that's just not the actual reality when you actually start to talk to people. And it's the same thing for the you know the quote unquote anti vax. I don't really like to use that very much because I think it's so divisive. But uh, it's the same thing for that group of people where people assume it's just these, you know, January 6th types that are storming the Capitol that are pro-Trump and they're the ones who are against getting a vaccine. And that's not actually true. We know from the numbers that it's a, a lot of people of color who tend to vote Democrat who are extremely hesitant about taking the vaccine. So neither side is really truly representing what's actually happening in the discourse around these subjects. And so I, I think you're right that we can't have a meaningful debate and we can't actually move forward without acknowledging that there are people with these you know, thinking a certain way and they come from all walks of life and we can't just, you know, box them into these separate categories. Or, uh, I think I'd be curious for Emily's take on this because you might have uh, more recent understanding of the, of the polling data. My understanding is that actually on, on the in the Democratic camp, there's actually been a swing in the last, say, five years 
maybe even five to seven years or so, where it was the case that Democrats were divided over the question mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. But much more, but more recently, there's been a polarization around around it where almost all, de not all Democrats, obviously, but almost all of them are for it. You can't really find the Stupaks and the Lipinskis yeah. in, in the House anymore. Now, just because that House is, you know, 100% you know, uh, pro-choice doesn't mean that their voters are, but getting pretty close to a, a unified I, I, position. Or, I, or, I actually that. thought it was the opposite. I actually mm -hmm. thought it was the opposite, right? When I looked at data, I thought that it was, there was a period of time where everybody was, you know, there was a hot debate and then it kind of separated and then now it's kind of getting closer together, actually. What's always interesting- Because of Latino um, voters. So the, yeah, that, the that, that's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, and what's always interesting is to look at where uh, the split is in terms of legal in all circumstances and legal in certain circumstances right. when right. pollsters ask, ask that, and that's where there still is a divide yeah. in Democrats. I think that Ryan's right that broadly uh, Democrats, in terms of like pro-life versus pro-choice, when you pit it with that framing, the black and white sort of framing, um, that mm -hmm. Democrats are more, I, I guess, would are more coalesced around the issue than they used to be in the past. But there's still a huge divide in terms of legal in all circumstances and certain circumstances, right. which I right. think does put some Democrats sort of against the Democratic establishment. Right. But I think, Kim, your point on uh, the vaccine comparison is, is an interesting one, uh, because, you know, e even though like I might get frustrated sometimes with some of the arguments that you'll make around vaccines, like it's 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 a useful conversation. It's good. It's good to force me to kind of sharpen mm -hmm. my thinking around around that question. And it's a, it's a view that is that that does represent some non-trivial to significant portion of the American public and deserves an airing and doesn't really get it 100%. In, in the media. Well, I can't wait for Emily and I to go at it then about, about pro-choice versus pro-life. <laughs> we'll talk her into it. <laughs> Good luck. Next on Rising, White House reporter for Real Clear Politics, Philip Wegman weighs in on Joe Biden's vaccine mandates. Stick with us.